Um, so our next section is about common misconceptions and false parallels about voting technology. Um, and our presenters are David Jefferson, who I introduced before, that's the chairman of Verified Voting, and Joe Hall, who's the chief technologist and director for Internet Architecture Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, so let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, Jake. <clears throat> okay, what I'm going to talk about is not about particular voting systems or the code or uh, vulnerabilities or anything like that. I'm going to talk about the requirements for voting and how they compare with the requirements for other applications, uh, uh, online applications in particular. Um, the point I'm going to be making, the bottom line, is that from a technical point of view, the security, privacy, transparency, reliability, uh, and other uh, properties of voting as an application are more complex, harder to satisfy than, for, uh, th than any of the other security problems you're likely to have encountered. I'm going to make a detailed comparison between voting and e-commerce as the prime example. Um, so uh, let me move on here. First, I want to just show up this generic slide about the, the large number of technical requirements that have to be satisfied simultaneously to have a satisfactory public election. Now, I'm not going to read all this slide. I'm just going to read the, the uh, headings here. Uh, voter authentication issues, a double vote prevention, a ballot selection, I mean, the person gets the correct ballot, uh, Capture, accurately capturing the voters' choices, the integrity of the balloting process, the, uh, the accuracy of the tally of those ballots, the two different kinds of privacy, which I will come back to in a moment, um, mixed mode ballots, uh, uh, software certification, software integrity, the availability and reliability of the voting process, all forms of security uh, issues, transparency, manageability, and the mission criticality. Now, I'm going to highlight only a couple of those. I'm not going to read all of them. But I wanted to, first of all, talk about uh, ballot, uh, ballot integrity, that, uh, of course, um, that uh, no ballots are lost, no ballots are corrupted in the process, and no phony ballots are inserted into the process in the course of an election. Um, I want to highlight uh, privacy and what I call privacy too, two different notions of privacy that are simultaneously requirements for a public election. The first uh, notion is that uh, it should be impossible to associate a cast ballot with the person who cast it, at least up to the size of a precinct. So the most you should be able to say is, uh, is that you cast one of the 150 ballots that are in the ballot box at that precinct this day. So that, that's, that's as close as we ought to be able to identify you, the size of a precinct. And nobody should be able to, to identify any closer than that. Not a court, not an election official, nobody. That's a, that's a strong privacy requirement. The second privacy requirement is a little more subtle. Even if the voter wants to tell you or tell the world how the voter how he voted, he can do so. He's free to declare how he voted, but he's not free to prove it. He is not allowed to have any proof. And the protection that, that is afforded by that is uh, a voter who can't prove how he voted uh, is less subject to coercion than a voter who has proof, and so the coercer could demand that proof as to how he voted. And a voter who can't prove how he voted can't sell his vote. You can't sell one vote, and you can't create a market for vote buying and selling. So this second privacy uh, uh, criterion is different from the first one, but both are critical to, uh, to strong election integrity. Now, I mentioned uh, reliability and security and transparency. The point about reliability is that all those previous properties um, have to hold, even in the case of uh, partial failures of the voting system, partial technical failures. If a voting machine goes down um, or if, the, if the, uh, the 
the, the local area network in a voting precinct goes down or the poll book goes down or something like that, you have to be able to finish the election anyway. It has to be ro robust against all kinds of uh, partial system failures. Of course, nothing will be robust against, you know, a, a regional power failure perhaps, but um, uh, at least partial system failures. And security talks about all of the other good properties the election has to, ha uh, has to have have to, have to hold even in the case of a limited, at least, conspiracy of election officials, programmers, voters, third parties to undermine the election, okay? Even if they're trying to do so, uh, we need to be able to conduct an election and, and guarantee the integrity even in the face of that. Okay, um, now let me move on. So I'm going to, I said I was going to talk to you about how voting is distinctly different from other uh, security problems. And the comparison I'm going to make is online commerce, let's say buying things from Amazon, versus online voting, um, you know, vo voting from your home uh, computer. Now, we don't, uh, we don't have a lot of online voting in the United States. We have some. Um, online voting is an extremely dangerous idea, but I'm not here to... Uh, rail against it from that point of view. I'm, wanna, I'm talking about requirements here. And people have a tendency to think in terms that, that, that if I can shop safely online, why can't I vote safely online? After all, the two are very similar. They both involve a simple online transaction. You navigate to the correct website, you identify yourself, once you're identified, you make your choices, your purchases, or your votes. Uh, when you've looked over your purchases and your votes and you're happy, you press that, you know, buy button or that vote button, and you're done. It's a, so an, superficially, from a, just a sing, an online trax, transaction point of view, they sound very similar. And what I'm about to, to try to convince you of now is that they are not remotely similar, except in that superficial sense. So on the left side there are the, uh, are the categories of differences that I'm going to be talking about and the middle column is shopping and the right hand column would be voting. For shopping, there's no eligibility requirement of who's allowed to buy from Amazon. You can be a kid, you can be a non-citizen, you can be a felon, we don't care. Amazon does not care. They don't have an eligibility requirement. But we do have strong eligibility requirements for who is allowed to vote in a U.S. election, and we have to ascertain them. Um, we, we, we do that in all states at voter registration time, and in a growing number of states now, we also do it, uh, voter ID states, at voting time, for at least for in-person voters, if not for absentee voters. So there's this eligibility issue that distinguishes the two. Then there's the double vote transaction. Everybody knows that you can't vote twice in the same election. But Amazon doesn't care if you buy two pairs or four pairs of socks in the same transaction or if you come back and buy more things ten times in the same day. There is no, no analog to the notion of vote, double vote prohibition in the e-commerce world. Again, it's more an additional requirement or, or structural difference, um, more difficult in the voting world. Proxy transactions. A proxy transaction is when you uh, authorize explicitly or implicitly somebody else to use your Amazon account. Your kid, your spouse, or you give somebody your credit card number, or you give them your password. Amazon doesn't care if you do that. That's perfectly legal. They're okay with that. They don't even know. However, in the voting world, Proxy voting is not allowed. You cannot authorize somebody to vote for you under any circumstances in any of the states, period. Um, so the consequence of those first three differences between shopping and voting is that we, it, uh, uh, appears in the issue of voter or of identification and authentication. In the case of Amazon and e-commerce, they are satisfied with weak authentication of who the buyer is. The true identity of the buyer is not really required. When you sign up for an Amazon account, they don't ask for your driver's license number. They don't ask for your passport. They don't ask for your picture. They don't really care who you are. What they care about is that when you later do a transaction, 
that the transaction is probably good and the credit card is definitely valid at the moment of the transaction. That's what they care about. But the identity of exactly who's buying, you or your spouse or your kid, they don't really care. I mean, they'd like it for marketing information, but it's not a, it's not a barrier to the purchase if they don't actually know who you are. But in voting, because we, can't, we do have to know that you're eligible to vote, we can't allow you to vote twice, and you, we can't allow you to vote for somebody else, we need strong voter uh, identification and authentication um, to, to guarantee those properties. And it's even harder online, in, if we're talking about online voting, because we are worried about uh, large-scale attacks through weaknesses in authentication. You need strong authentication uh, of ballots, uh, sorry, of voters. Additional distinctions between shopping and voting. Uh, privacy, the privacy rules for shopping are, well, both parties, the buyer and the seller, know everything about all parts of the transaction. They know what you're buying, how much it costs, how to return it, or wh wh you know, what, what happens if the transaction somehow goes bad. Um, and you actually do get a receipt in some sense for the transaction, which you can show to a third party and you can prove to a court, for example, if the transaction goes bad, that you have the details and you have the proof of it. But in voting, uh, who casts what vote is, a, is an absolute secret, as I said earlier. Um, and a, a voter knows how she voted, but she must not be able to prove it to a third party. It's a different, much more subtle uh, privacy requirement. The privacy requirements for shopping are policy requirements, uh, business and, and contractual arrangements that the, that the seller has with the buyer. Uh, they are cased in law in, in voting. Um, the in integrity. In integrity. Integrity means that the transaction is actually correctly done. So the, the, uh, in the case of shopping, uh, Amazon will not go out of business if 1% of all of its transactions are fraudulent. And it's a good thing because they are. But in the voting world, we cannot tolerate a 1%. We can't tolerate a one-tenth of 1% error. Uh, we really need uh, systems that are architected and designed and intended and as far as humanly possible 100% accurate recording of every transaction, especially in this era of closer and closer elections. Okay? Nonetheless, errors occur anyway. So let's talk about error detectability. In the commerce world, failures and frauds are going to be detectable uh, eventually because of uh, double entry bookkeeping and the presence of receipts in both directions and a paper trail and if nothing else some account is going to go to zero someday and you're going to detect it. But in the voting world uh, modified vote transactions may be completely undetectable and uh, Privacy violations, the requirement that, vote, that votes be, made, be private in the two ways that I described, are almost always undetectable. So we have this, uh, one of the burdens that we have in architecting election systems is uh, the, the fact that many errors are, are fundamentally undetectable because the, the voting officials, they don't know how you intended to vote. And if you claim that they recorded your vote incorrectly, you can't prove it to them as a third party. So it's just really not fundamentally possible in many cases to actually detect that an error happened at all. Even if you did detect it, let's talk about recoverability. In the case of the shopping world, there are all kinds of ways to recover uh, from bad transactions. Many times they're reversible with returns or refunds, other ameliorations like uh, insurance and tax deductions and just price increases to recover the losses. Those are, there are all kinds of ways to deal with the risk of faulty or fraudulent transactions in the commerce world. But even if you detected in the voting world that there was a fraudulent vote cast, you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Because if I know there's a fraudulent vote cast, I don't know what the vote should have been. I don't know who cast it. I can't 
I can't bring them to justice. Uh, the, the recoverability issue is far more troubling, both detection and recovery, recoverability, in the elections world than it is in the commerce world. And finally, additional, there, this is my last slide here, availability. Uh, Amazon needs to be up almost all the time, but if they were down for an hour a year, uh, they wouldn't, you know, that they wouldn't fail. Or if they were down for 10 hours a year, they wouldn't fail. They would fire their IT team, maybe, but they would not suffer catastrophic losses. However, voting on election day must be up, period. Because whereas Amazon would suffer a uh, certain amount of loss of business and, or most likely just only delayed business, uh, there are statutory requirements for the, for the date that Election Day is, and you can't postpone it, and you can't uh, ask, well, our voter, come back tomorrow. We're getting, fixing our systems today. That's just not an option. Um, so the damage from down, downtime in a voting system on Election Day is basically unrecoverable. The transparency requirements are different, too. In the shopping world, uh, buyers have only the right to examine and question the details of their own transactions, period. Nobody else's. But in the voting world, voters and candidates and the press and everybody else, at least in principle, has a right to examine and observe and audit every detail about the election, period, from soup to nuts, up to uh, as long as they preserve the privacy properties of the, the, the you know, no, no identification of which voter cast which ballot. But everything else is supposed to be transparent, at least in principle. In practice, it's not, but uh, I'm talking in principle here. Uh, the motivations of attackers are completely different, too. People who attack Amazon... Uh, uh, Amazon transactions are usually motivated by money. They're trying to steal your personal data. They're trying to steal your credit card number. But in the voting world, the desire is almost, f almost always political. They're trying to fix the outcome of the election or they're trying to disrupt the election. Uh, they may also be making money doing that if they are fixing the election on behalf of somebody else who's paying them. And, but the con and, the, and finally, the consequences of a successful attack are completely different in the in the voting and e-commerce world. Somebody loses money, usually the merchant, not the shopper, it, with, a, with a fraudulent or faulty transaction in the, in the shopping world. But in the voting world, the wrong people may be elected. The wrong uh, initiatives that, that, that should have passed fail or should have failed pass. And the legitimacy of democratic government is, under, uh, is undermined and our national security is imperiled. So the bottom line here is voting, security, privacy, transparency, availability, reliability, all in every dimension more difficult than the, uh, than the security problems that you may have encountered in other application domains. Joe. Oh, we're about to switch. That's OK. We, uh, you would think we would have solved the projector problems by now in the, in the world. You're close. You got it. There you go. Thank you, sir. And it's such a joy to share the stage with people like David and Candace and, and Matt Blaze after this. They're, we've been working on this stuff for a long time, and they are... Uh, mentors and role models for, for, for me and for a ton of other people, and I'll stop gushing. Anyway, hi, my name's Joe. You, you may have seen me earlier today. I'm from the Center for Democracy and Technology in Washington, D.C. Um, I should mention I am hiring an election technology fellow, so if you know something about cybersecurity and election technology, please come talk to me. Um, I'll be here all weekend. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about a number of what I would consider common misconceptions, things you hear people shout. Why don't we just do this? Or why don't we just do that? Or aha, I have a, a, a solution to this extremely complicated problem that you've never thought of about before. Don't dare talk about blockchain and Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies to me. 
You don't put anything on the blockchain you expect to be secret for 80 years. Just, okay? Like, that's it. You know, we're using public key cryptography for this crap. So that's not on here, but I, I wanted to rant a little bit about that. Um, so I'm going to go through five misconceptions. I'm going to go pretty quickly, uh, just because you may, one, have beef with my interpretation, or two, have your own misconception that you'd like to raise. And I'd love to just get into that and talk about that stuff, because that's where the action is. You don't want to hear me talk too much. So just use hand-counted paper ballots is often what you hear people say. Why can't we just do it like how Canada does or how England does it? And that's because they have a parliamentary system where you make exactly one choice on the ballot. We have extremely complicated ballots. Uh, the Netherlands has pretty complicated ballots, but then again, it's, it's it, anyway, uh, we have very complicated ballots. All, all, you know, in California, there are mosquito abatement district uh, Contest. It's almost a dog catcher on your ballot, which is, is, is great because you want people to uh, be able to elect things that they need to elect. Maybe we, maybe we make too many decisions in the voting box, but that's, that's a more of a political statement. Um, we also try our best to enfranchise as many people as possible. Many, many other classes of people do we want to try and uh, allow the ability to vote independently and privately um, by themselves. So people with disabilities, uh, people with vision impairment, it's very difficult. People with motor uh, disabilities is also difficult. Difficult. If you have compound disabilities, so if you uh, uh, have hearing uh, disabilities and a, a, a sight disability, that's extremely hard. There have been actually a couple of voting systems, maybe just one, that targeted these, that particular kind of compound disability. There are um, uh, Native American languages that have no written form that even though these people are literate and, and speak, they would prefer to vote in the language that they speak at home, and we, we try our best to enfranchise them. L.A. County, for example, I think has 11 languages, things like Laotian. You know, it's not even included in the Voting Rights Act, which is the thing that so tends to tell you what kind of languages you have to support given traditionally disenfranchised uh, populations. But what we want to do is make sure that if, if, you, if you, as my dad would say, don't dream in English, we want to make sure you can vote in the language that you dream in. Um, and third, it's just faster and easier, and it can be much more usable to use a touchscreen for, for many people. Paper, when designed correctly, is awesome. But imagine trying to put 11 languages on a single piece of paper. <laughs> if you can do that, man, you can make a lot of money. Um, but I, that's not to say that there's no place for, for paper ballots at all. For example, the voter verified paper audit trail. Um, optical scan ballots are exactly what we're talking about. That's rooting trust and reliability and indelibility in a physical object. Um, a colleague of ours, Doug Jones, prefers etched aluminum, but we haven't found a way to do that in a, that would be cheap and, and quick and, and all these other things. It would last for hundreds of years, uh, which is maybe not such a good thing. I'm not sure. Um, we also do recounts. These are the heavily lawyered up. We're going to count every single ballot and see if we come up with a different re a result. And then stuff that we worked on in my postdoc um, at Princeton and uh, that Philip Stark has really sort of led uh, from Berkeley are these things called risk-limiting audits. And these are statistical methods of counting a random sample of ballots, comparing it to the corresponding data structure. So you're looking at, here's the thing the person marked, here's the data structure that interprets what the person marked. Um, and th those are statistical tests designed to make sure that if you find enough error that would cause the outcome to, to, to be different, that you would actually have announced somebody else, you escalate till you've actually counted all the ballots, right? Or more practically in some places, you may have to rerun an election, which is easier for smaller elections, almost impossible uh, legally constitutionally for something like the presidential election. Damn it. That means I'm taking too much time on each slide, guys. Um, anyway, so that's one. Hacking is a new thing in elections. So if you've been in this whole track all day, you may hear some of this over and over again. Oh, damn it. Cool, awesome. Thank you, goon. Cycle, cycle, cycle. Uh, I'll just talk. Um, so there's been a, a, a considerable amount of hacking of various kinds. Hacking is just a horrible word. It's such a big umbrella word, right? You can, you can almost describe any kind of interference or meddling is the, the word of, of, uh, of the now for elections. You can just sort of say, hey, they did something. We're not sure what they did, but they did something. Or in some cases, we know what they did. Um, in fact, the U.S. has a pretty substantial history, and I, I have a lot of notes on this that I can share with you. Um, if, if you have any friends that are, that are Chilenas or Chilenos, in Chile, we did a whole bunch of horrible things to, to them, using mostly money in elections. In Italy, to make sure the communists didn't get elected, we did a bunch of things there. Um, in the Philippines, there's just a, a, those weren't like actual direct interventions in the machinery of their democracies, so to speak, but they were ways of, of using influence and power to directly change the outcome of elections. 
The coolest story is the Ukraine 2014 election, which you may have heard of. And if you haven't, there's a really cool short paper I can point you at. Um, a hacker group affiliated with the, the Russian government, uh, supposedly, uh, broke into the Ukrainian Central Election Administrator's uh, tabulation server, changed the, the results uh, about an hour before they were going to be announced. The Ukrainians found out, rolled everything back, and announced the real results, but Russian television actually reported the result that the hackers hacked into the, the machine. And so that's like, the only time we've ever seen something that is probably as close to confirmation of an actual hack that we've ever seen. The, the other things are not nearly as sexy. So for example, there's a bunch of denial of service attacks and while those are very powerful, you know, that's like everyone's hammer, right? It's, it's, it's always gonna be there. It's always gonna be hard to protect against, increasingly so. Um, there was a case, I think in Illinois, I was having a hard time tracking this down, but I will find it, where a poll worker ran an optical, uh, I think it was a couple poll workers, ran an optical scan ballot through the optical scanner like 200 extra times, trying to inflate the count for one particular contest. But it's really easy to just count the number of ballots in the bin and recognize, oh geez, there's 200 pieces of paper missing or this is off and just recount the stuff. So that was caught and they were prosecuted. Um, and then this is one that, that, that David uh, Jefferson told me about, that there was an insider attack on the Canvas database in the uh, uh, 1994 presidential election in South Africa, the, the first election for Mandela. I didn't even know about that one, so that's, that's really awesome. Uh, I mean, it's, it's good to know about. So hacking has happened before. Um, and we've covered this a little bit, you know, this strict anonymity requirement. People are often saying, well, that's where your problem is. If you didn't have this strict anonymity requirement, you wouldn't have all these problems. So, for example, in the United Kingdom, when you go vote, you sign your name right next to a number that's printed on your ballot. So there's an actual mapping between your signature and the number on your ballot. But that mapping is kept as, as essentially a state secret that you have to meet very high bar in an actual election fraud uh, uh, court case and able to unmask that masking, uh, unmask that mapping. Uh, anyway, uh, so this gets actually kind of interesting. You may not have realized this, but <laughs> When, in the very beginning of at least the United States, and obviously this is a, a more global room than just the U.S., but uh, uh, you had to be a white male landowner in order to vote, right? And so you had to own a certain amount of land, um, not just any land. It had to be a certain size. You had to be a man, and you had to be a white man at that. Um, and what you would do is you would actually raise your hand or announce your vote, viva voce, out loud. That's awesome in terms of transparency. You could actually sit there and record Everyone could independently record it and come up with their own results. But what that means is the coercion and the um, for forms of undue influence like vote buying is still uh, right there. You know, a father could say to the son, hey, you're not going to inherit that land that you want so bad if you don't show me exactly how you voted before you cast a ballot. And I should mention, there's only one state in the U.S. that allows you to show your ballot to someone before you cast it and it's West Virginia. For some reason in the Constitution, it has this thing about open voting which allows you to show your ballot to someone. So if you were gonna buy a ballot, it's, it's still illegal to, to purchase votes in West Virginia, but if you were gonna do it, that would be the mechanism to do it. Um, you're not gonna get a lot of votes, I don't think. Um, and, and so before about 1900, election day was a payday for most American voters. You would go to the, to the polls, there'd be a bunch of people with very bright, um, and distinctive colors of paper that were partisan ballots that listed for one party all the people. And you would sit there and just play them off each other until you got en enough money. And they could go and watch you deposit it in and then give you the second half of, of what they would want to pay you. And it was about three months worth of, of pay. Um, we adopt this thing called the Australian ballot around uh, most states uh, between 1890 and about 1905 adopted the Australian ballot. This is a anonymous ballot printed by the government on a uniform stock with everyone's name printed the same size on the same ballot, right? Um, when that happened, voter participation rates just plummeted because it was no longer a payday and now it was your actual civic duty. You had to actually care, you had to give a shit and go and vote to do that stuff. Um, and it's also you know, really important to be able to make sure that the votes are anonymous so that you don't have uh, in days like now where you don't, you wouldn't go to a polling place necessarily and do that, but there could be, uh, you know, uh, coordination mechanisms involving actual cryptocurrencies to pay you. Things like Zcash, right? The thing that is the, the more the anonymous version of Bitcoin. Um, and now, you know, and this is something else that David Jefferson pointed out to me, you know, this is such a, a 
tense political climate we live in that you can imagine that no, no you know, uh, uh, never has the anonymity of your vote been more important. You could be someone in, in a party who holds an a, a unpopular view all of a sudden, and they may take retribution on you if they found you voted away uh, that they didn't want you to. Okay, so, and this is, so here's ones that are maybe more interesting to the technical folks in the room. Um, you'll hear people say, our, our voting system is highly distributed, um, so it's hard to attack. Um, that, that I should say that, that monoculture and the absence of monoculture, it's a weak guard at best. You know, as people have said, there are often similarities across systems that can be exploited, even if they're very different um, platforms. But it's only really a benefit, this distribution, to contests that span more than one jurisdiction. And what do I mean by that? I mean that if you have your proverbial Tony Soprano, I guess Tony Soprano was never in a proverb, so whatever. Um, have your fictitious Tony Soprano, if, if, if he could fix a local waste management bond in his favor for 100 grand, say a $5 million waste management bond or something like that, not a very big number, um, that means it, the threat model there is for that one jurisdiction, that one county, that one town, they're gonna have to start thinking about stuff like that and planning for uh, the nasties that are, that are around your town uh, trying to influence your, your employees and otherwise get into the systems. Um, and even then, many states are dominated by very populous single or, or, or one or two or three jurisdictions, right? And um, because voting equipment has a hard time scaling, it's, it's, it's more than likely that those jurisdictions are gonna be running the same voting, voting software or at least not very different um, voting machines and software. And so those statewide races can be influenced by attacking one or two local jurisdictions. And then when you have a lot of jurisdictions, um, it, you, could pick the, you can sort of pick the easiest ones to attack. So maybe there's, you, you could attack the big jurisdictions, but it turns out that they have really good cybersecurity practices and regular physical security practices and you know, whatever, Plato security practices. If they have all those things set, you might be like, well, geez, um, I can go attack a piece of lower hanging fruit. I may have to change more votes. Uh, I may have to disrupt more um, records. Um, and like something that I care a lot about, you know, your voting, uh, voter, voter registrator databases are um, online, but they're often, the canonical versions are in staged, you know, air-gapped networks that are updated with deltas every few days and stuff like that. But the data on voter registration systems that is then staged for electronic poll books, these are the, the computers we're using instead of spiral brown notebooks anymore um, in polling places. You can imagine that staged data is sitting somewhere, probably not very well secured, but we hope so before it's put on those poll books. That's a natural place to do a very disruptive attack where you um, single out even a given party or just randomly select people in a place that have a certain kind of political affiliation. Finally, um, the systems are not connected to the internet. So you may have heard this a lot too. Um, and I love to point out what Dan Wallach has said in the past. It's like, yeah, we had viruses before the internet. We had these things called floppy disks. And they would be uh, transmission vectors for uh, uh, malware. And there, there's just so many ways to cross air gaps these days. You know, like I was, in my earlier talk today, I talked about um, uh, uh, air gap networks having rogue Wi-Fi uh, 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 attached to them for whatever reason um, to help people out because people don't recognize that that may be a security vulnerability, um, but it helps them do their work better. Um, and, and so, you know, insider attacks is, is another really good point to make here is that um, insiders have the ability to cross the air gap if you get the right insider. Um, and you know, where there's the machines in the voting village, which I highly recommend you go check out. The AccuVote TS, which is still being used in Georgia, was one where Ed Felton, his team designed a, a virus that you could put on during the primary on one machine, and then between the primary and the general election, it would propagate to all the other equipment so that you'd have the hack ready for the general election. So while th these requirements are really hard, um, and, it, and it means our security models have to be a little different, there are even, there are, the attackers are gonna be just as clever to get around those kinds of things. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you, there's my GPQG key signal if you wanna talk about any of this or if you wanna um, potentially come work for me, that would be wonderful. Uh, we'd love to take questions. I'm just yell and I'll repeat it. So uh, I live in Washington where we have both like mail and district. And for the first talk, there's a lot of these requirements about, oh, you have to have like 100% of this, you have to have 100% of that, you can't change this. And I feel like vote by mail has already addressed a lot of these problems. For example, like stuff gets lost in the mail. I mean, you can always go in person and fix that, but I mean, there's a lot of things where um, it seems like these problems are. Maybe some of it's a staff 
Well, <laughs> Washington until recently was uh, was a singular case because of the uh, because, well in Oregon. Uh, I don't have the same confidence in vote by mail that you do. Okay, number one is authentication of the voter is very weak. Okay, the best you have is a signature check, which is often not really even done or is only done. Uh, with uh, with software aid, usually you don't have a strong way of authenticating who the voter is. So in in most uh, states in the United States, when there is vote fraud, if it's not committed by election officials, it's committed through mail-in voting. So mail-in voting is definitely weaker. Yes, you you say you, you seem to shrug your shoulders when you said that your your vote could be lost in the mail, as though that didn't matter. The fact is, you as the you as the voter may not know that, or you may not learn it until late until too late. And yes, maybe you can go and vote in person if you discover on time that your vote didn't make it. But the point is you may have voted by mail because you were out of state or not in a position to go. I mean, for many people, that, that, uh, that's what absentee voting is all about in every other state besides, besides Washington and Oregon and Colorado. So I guess I'm not as cavalier about the strengths of, of mail-in voting as you are. Um, I don't think it's a good idea for it to be universal, as it is in Washington and Oregon. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think it strengthens democracy to have that be the only mode of voting. Let's, let's move yeah. on. Well, so, and so just to make a quick comment, uh, I vote by mail in a place that has universal vote by mail. I really appreciate it because I, I, I'm so busy that I, that's, but I, I think uh, the computer science community at least that, that works on elections recognizes that, um, I think I'm speaking for many people at once that I don't have the liberty to, but I'm going to and say that, that I think we have the opposite view that vote by mail tends to relax a lot of these requirements. To, like for example, <laughs> I know a guy, I know a guy in uh, San Francisco who gives his lawyer his ballot with his signature on it and $200 and has his lawyer vote for him, which is like, it's, vote, it's weird. It's, it's not vote buying, it's not coercion. It's more like, you'll make better decisions than I will because I trust you, Mr. Lawyer, and stuff like that. And so it allows a bunch of things that are sort of uh, wrinkles in this stronger model of things. And the trick there is the, is, the models that sort of fit in place in terms of, uh, in, in place of universal vote by mail are, 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 are newer things like vote centers, right? Where you have, instead of a small polling places all over the place, you have big polling places that you can go to any one of them. Uh, the problem with stuff like that is if you have optical scan ballots, you have to have a, enough copies of every ballot style, which can, in a primary election with a bunch of parties, can just can grow geometrically. And so, Print on demand for sure it works very well. Some states that's very hard, right? Because you got to certify the the actual printer and the people doing the printer as being ballot printing entities, right? But that means we can change the laws. But print on demand is is a way to do that. You don't get some of the features you get uh, um, from actual um, bonded printers in print on demand. Uh, but anyway, and there are things. I'm sorry, I'll shut up, but Larry. So the question was, at what point does um, the convenience versus security, what point does turnout be, get affected by um, the tension between convenience and security? So if you make things too secure and not convenient enough, are you lowering turnout? It's a great question. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of research on that. Paul Gronke and folks like that who, who, who do a lot of voter sentiment analysis may have data on that. Um, there's probably some natural experiments, but I don't know. Um, it, it's something we have to uh, uh, plan well for and make sure that elections are as usable as possible and easy as possible, but no easier, right? <laughs> Sir. Is 
so let me try and repeat the question. Let me know if I got it wrong. Uh, is there a any theoretical model that preserves anonymity in voting um, where you can say it again? Treat each vote as an atomic transaction, sort of like acid, right? Um, um, So there are formal methods here, and there are people who who model polling places. Um, I'm not sure if that exactly would answer your question, but come find me, and I can at least point you to some of those papers. And, and if it's not there, maybe you can do it. But I, I have a feeling that, that the polling place models people use, especially in queuing theory, which is you know how how often how often do people arrive at a polling place to, to optimize the distribution of voting machines? They have to deal with that stuff all the time. I would, I would just say that vote, voting at a precinct is an atomic transaction if it, from a, say, computing point of view. I mean, from beginning to the end of the transaction, you're not interfered with as a voter. And uh, if I understand you correctly, yes, a voting transaction is intended to be atomic. Maybe that sounds like, sounds like I didn't say it's bad. Come talk to us. Candace? Uh, the first one was, say it again, sorry. <laughs> ah. To, 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 sure, so vote by mail is, is, is counted somehow. Um, in some places it is counted by hand in very tiny places. But um, many places there they use optical scanners, sometimes central count optical scanners, which I don't think we have any here. They're really curious machines. They're very high throughput. Um, expensive, you know, $100,000, you can think of like Pitney Bowes mail handler kind of things, um, to very quickly go through these, these uh, systems. And in fact, in the Ohio study from 2007, we installed Linux on the ESNS one just to prove that it was a general purpose computing platform. Um, and they do have vulnerabilities. Um, and often, you know, the, the things like, like the tracking uh, capabilities where you um, as with your vote by mail ballot have a something that allows you to check and see that your vote by mail ballot has been received has then been counted and accepted that's so crucial because often you can see something happen there like hey it was rejected for some reason you and, and then you have it in many places you have a period of time to correct that stuff what you may not know and this is, happens with regular optical scan too is if that scanner correctly interpreted the marks you made on that ballot right and this is where the newer computer vision systems are, are a lot better at doing things that, that, that older systems couldn't do. For example, if you have an oval and someone circles the oval instead of filling it in or putting an X in it or something like that, um, older systems had a hard time catching this. It, it's, it sounds like from what I'm hearing from people that newer systems detect marginalized marks and are able to, to better count those. But it, it, it's not perfect and that's why you need to have regular audits and, and actually compare some of these marginal marks and, and figure out if they would have affected the, the, the race. And Candace, you said something about correctability. Could you repeat the question? Well, so that's a, that's that's a complex question. So, um, most of the time, there isn't a a second process after the canvas to check the initial canvas results at all. Now, you've heard it several times today. People have recommended that we have voter uh, that we have um, risk limiting audits of paper ballots. And the, the central idea there is that 
you would take a random sample of the paper ballots and, and check them by hand, and um, there's a st statistical criterion to indicate whether or not this confirms the results from the, from the original machine canvas or whether it disconfirms them. And, uh, and the, the thought is, though the law has not followed this yet, followed this yet is that if the risk-limiting audit afterwards or, uh, de determines that the results were originally um, incorrectly tabulated, either for procedural error or software error or malicious code or something like that, then the, uh, the results of the risk-limiting audit would legally replace those of the machine counts. And then you would presumably, that would immediately presumably in, con, uh, trigger an investigation, a forensic investigation of the voting machines and exactly why did they not match the results that, uh, of, a, of, a, of human counts of these ballots. Uh, right now, this law and these procedures are not in place, and we would, you know, it's one of the things that we are looking to try to uh, institute in every state in the union as soon as we can. And, and for, if, if anyone out there is a real math nerd, I, have I got something for you. Uh, Walter Mabane, who is a political scientist and a total math nerd, has a really cool election forensics course that all the materials are available online. And all he does is work with totals, with vote totals at the precinct level or whatever level, and uses various kinds of statistical tests to spot tampering. And he's used these in many, many a foreign country. Things like Benford's Law, which is, I won't get into it, but look it up, it's fun. It's basically the distribution of the first number in a distribution of numbers. So like the one in 1,045 or something like that, right? And then there's a second order Benford's Law, which is the second one. Anyway, these all have distributions that you can spot when someone is actually messing with stuff. But what can you do afterwards? You know, you're not gonna actually like renormalize the results like a census kind of a thing where you say, oh, well, we, we miscounted something, but we know how we miscounted and we're gonna do that. Man, lawyer, campaign lawyers will never let you get away with that. I did want to add one other thing, which is that um, the idea of doing forensic examinations of voting machines or the uh, back-end systems after an election, if and even if something is suspected is going wrong, there are no procedures, there is no law uh, to, uh, to permit, uh, let alone require, such investigations. Um, it's just not possible under the law today. In fact, it would be, it would be totally prohibited. So... Um, this is a, a frontier that I think we have to we have to change in the in the future. Yeah, I think we've got time for one more. Sir. Do we actually know the quality or magnitude of election tampering right now? Absolutely not. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Well, there, I mean, there, there are a few things we can say. I mean, I, may, I, I mentioned earlier that most of the cases of, de of detected fraud, you know, to, detected and prosecuted, have involved either election officials or vote by mail. Now, that doesn't tell you how many cases there are. It just says most of the, almost all of those that we have are of that kind. Um, the, the notion of voter ID that's been introduced in many states has been uh, touted as a protection against uh, vote fraud, but I think most of the people in this room know that that's totally ineffective, except against one kind of fraud, which never happens, which is a voter walking in and impersonating another voter in that same precinct. Just doesn't happen. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.